The Lord spoke to me concerning my day sessions and things, what I would be ministering on. And we started yesterday at part one, four words that can change your life. Now, teaching is explaining and preaching is proclaiming. I'll try to stay in the teaching explaining mode, but every once in a while, I just kind of have to jump over, you know, into the proclaiming. So go with me to the book of Mark chapter 11, the most famous chapter in the Word of Faith movement or lifestyle. Let me just say that. Mark 11, and most people think of 23 and 24, but, and that's true and it's wonderful, but I want to read. We'll start again. This is part two of full words that can change your life. Verse 12, and on the morrow when they will come from Bethany, he was hungry. Notice Jesus got hungry. Seeing a fig tree afar off having leaves, he came if happily he might find anything thereon. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves. For the time of figs was not yet. Now that's an amazing statement. Time of figs was not yet. In other words, the tree wasn't supposed to produce fruit. But yet God always said, be instant in season and out of season. You never know when God loved to come look at your fruit tree. Mm. Jesus answered and said unto it. So in other words, trees talk. Uh Trees hear. Trees listen. Mm. Jesus answered and said unto it. He answered. So was the fig tree saying something. (laughs) Just food for thought. Think about it for a minute. Would the fig tree say, oh Lord. (laughs) Mm. Jesus answered, said unto it. No man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. He said it so strong it turned red. Did, did, <laughs> did, 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 did it turn red in your Bible? It turned red in my Bible. <laughs> and his disciples heard it. That's an amazing statement. How does faith come? By hearing. Verse 20. And in the morning as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. Peter calling to remember saith unto him, Master, behold the fig tree which thou cursest it's withered away. Now, some people say it's okay to curse because Jesus cursed. Now, that's how stupid some people are. We call it asinine. <laughs> I'll leave the rest for your thought. <laughs> and Jesus answering saith unto them, have faith in God. Not only should you have the faith of God, you can't have faith in God unless you have the faith of God or faith toward God. So no, he said, have faith in God. And there are a lot of people today denying that God exists. And as I said yesterday, back in the 60s or late 60s, they ran out magazine covers that God is dead. Well, he's alive forevermore. But a lot of people are flowing in that thing. You know, uh, it's becoming popular to uh, desecrate God or to say he doesn't exist. It's amazing. You know, if you notice some of the... uh, 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 the comedians and different things, how they talk about God like it's nothing. And, and, you know, and that you're silly if you believe in God. You know. Oh, but their day is coming. As I said, there are no atheists after death. There are no unbelievers after death. People say, I don't believe that. That don't change it. You understand what I'm saying? So yesterday, I want to go over that. Then we're going to get into part two. I said, faith in God is a dominant. You can check your, uh, your notes if you took them yesterday. Faith in God is a dominant conviction concerning God. It's dominant in your life. What is it dominant about? His being, his character, and his government. See, to know somebody, you also need to know how they act or how they react. And what makes them tick, for lack of a better term. And what is God's being? What is his character? What is his government? And I said yesterday, in every area of life, it is impossible to succeed without believing. I told you that uh, yesterday, and and let me just read a a little bit more on that, that God gave a wonderful dream to the most powerful man in the world, and that was Pharaoh. See, and I believe in dreams, but a lot of people's dreams don't come to pass because they don't understand what it takes to make the dream come to pass. Just because you had a dream doesn't mean it's going to come to pass. Now, This boy, Joseph, was in jail for 20 years. So if you're in jail today, God ain't getting out of jail till you do. He'll never leave you or forsake you. So the Lord's been in prison many times. You see that? Because he goes where you go. Finally, and you know it, that Joseph was called an interpreter of dreams. But just because you have the understanding of a dream doesn't mean it's going to come to pass. That's why a lot of people get so disappointed in life. So after Joseph, as a slave, tells the most powerful man that his interpretation, 
that didn't help Pharaoh at all. Seven fat cows, seven lean cows, and all that kind of stuff. Well, what are we going to do? Now, Joseph said, well, I got a plan. He told him the plan. Now, notice something. God didn't give the power to the man with the dream. He gave the power to the man with the, dream, uh, with the plan. Do you see that? You got to have a plan for your dream, for your destiny and your destination. Now, if you notice, G, uh, Joseph was a dreamer. I didn't say this yesterday. I'll just say this again. Joseph was a dreamer. He had a phenomenal dream. His first dream was powerful, just as as powerful as the one given to Pharaoh. But it didn't help him at all. It made his daddy's mad and his brother wanted to kill him. And they sold him to his cousins. You got to watch family. They'll buy you, man. They sold him to his cousin, the Ishmaelites. Now, why didn't his dream come to pass at that time? It could have because Joseph at that time didn't have a plan for that dream. But he had a plan for Pharaoh's dream. And when he had a plan for Pharaoh's dream, it saved not only Egypt, but the world and the nation of Israel under Jacob's, uh, you know, uh, authority. It brought him to Egypt. Do you see that? So if you want something to come to pass, if you've got a vision or you have a dream, you must have a plan. God has always given me dreams and visions. I get them all the time. But then I always go, I have a business meeting the next day. Like I said, yes, I say, Lord, we need a plan. Let's talk about the plan. He said, well, what do you consider? I love that when God asks me what I think about things. I said, well, this is what I would do since, it's, since you ask it. Now, I'm not embarrassed to tell God what I think I would do. Now, some people think that's sacrilege. No, that's just called knowing God instead of knowing about him. I said, well, if you let me operate this thing, I'll run it this way. What you think? He said, that sounds good to me. So then the plan and the dream comes together and produces a manifestation. Amen. Now, we dealt a little bit. I gave you a little bit more this morning. Now, this is part two. I also said that your faith is a measure and condition of your victory. Write that down if you didn't write it yesterday. Your faith is a measure and condition of your victory. In other words, if your victory is big, it's because your faith would be. But it don't take a lot of faith to get something big done. Faith the size of a mustard seed. Think about that. Now, how big is a mustard seed? Well, they ain't no more bigger than about a bit off fingernail. But God said if you had that much portion, if you want to think of it in the natural, you could say to a mountain, Notice that. Be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea. So the only place you can hide a mountain is in the sea. Think about that. Now, you see, he gave you, he, he don't care how big your obstacle is, but he's very concerned about how much faith you're using to get it. Now, some people love to see the mountain, so, and they think it's a godly mountain, they want to climb it. But God never made you a mountain climber, he made you a mountain dissolver. Now, everybody waiting for God to do it. God is not a mountain climber. He's a mountain dissolver. He said, if you would say unto this mountain, you, not God, be thou removed. Then you got to tell it where to go. Now, you tell everybody else where to go, so you ought to better tell your mountain where to go. Right? Be thou cast in the sea. Not down your heart. Believe those things which you say. This all has to do with you. You shall have whatsoever you say then whatsoever things you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive. Not believe in, the, oh, God is coming to back. No, believe that you receive. Yeah, but I don't have it yet. I didn't say that. Believe that you receive. Believe that you receive. That's where it starts. Believe that you receive. Not when you get it. I'm believing, I'm believing, I'm believing. I mean, I like confession, but believing sometimes, I mean, somebody's believing and believing and believing sound like an auctioneer. You're trying to convince yourself that this is going to work. <laughs> but he said, what sort of things that, so ever you desire when you pray, not God, God ain't anything to do with this. When you pray, believe that you receive. You believe that you receive. So I, you know, when I was believing for my intercontinental jet a few years ago, people say, you got that, that you got that jet? I said, can you see it? <laughs> they said, no. I said, I got it. Because the evidence of it is not seen. Now that will confuse the devil and a lot of Christians. Because <laughs> the evidence of it is not seen. Well, what happens when it's seen? Within this manifestation. Okay. So that's what I mean by that. Your faith is a measure and condition of your victory. Then I said this, if you do not believe in what you're doing, you cannot do it well. Now, Mark chapter 7, verse 37, this is with Jesus' reputation. He hath done all things well. Now, see, can people say that about you? That you have done all things well. Ah, that's a wonderful thing. So if you do not believe in what you're doing, and you'd be surprised how many people step out and not believe what they're doing and asking people to believe with them, even though they're not believing it. You cannot do it well. I've seen a lot of people like that. 
You can tell fear, boy. I mean, they, you know, they want you to get involved in their vision, but they don't even believe it themselves. So I, and I, without sounding prideful or arrogant, I can do all things well. You looking at a man that I, I, I can do things well. It's called work. The only time I find success ahead of work is in the dictionary. That's the only place you're going to find it. It's called W-O-R-K, work. Do what you got to do. Whatever it takes. You understand? You got the revelation right there. Then I said this, the secret of the church's strength is revealed in the words, have faith in God. People say, boy, but Jesse, you seem so confident. Why? Not because of my faith. I just have faith in God. I'm not by myself. Do you understand what I'm saying? I'm never alone. I've traveled all my adult life. Well, not all of it. You know, I've had people ask me, have you lived in New Orleans all your life? Not yet. <laughs> I think we've got a little bit more time to consider. But I just know. I, I quit that believing stuff a long time ago. I was a life of Christian frustration, trying to believe something. Believe in something or trying to become something I already am. You'd be surprised how many people trying to become righteous when they're already righteous. So Paul said, I know. Now I know, and when I know, I know. I think, oh, Robert, you said he, you got to know it in your knower, whoever that is. I know in whom I have believed. I know if I sow seed, I will reap. People say, why are you, you seem to get a hundredfold real easy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know. Amen. Who do you think you are? I know. Well, I've read the same scripture. Okay. <laughs> Next question. Yeah. But do you know? Well, ah, well, what you say? Well, ah, that tells me right there. We're going to have a struggle on hand. I know, and I know about you, I'm an American and I like things fast. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I like things fast, don't you? Yeah. Americans like things fast. Yeah. Fast food. We don't like to wait for nothing. Yeah. If you're in a restaurant for 30 <laughs> seconds, we got a problem here. <laughs> Am, am I true? Uh, excuse me. Am, is, that, is that true? Well, you know, the Lord likes obedience fast. Mm. Now, we lost a few of you right there. <laughs> you can tell when it hits. Some people go, hey, hey. <laughs> he just likes obedience. Obey. Just obey. Go do it. So I, I just like things fast. Now, what stops having faith in God. A one little word called doubt. Doubt. And you'd be surprised how much Christians will put it in you. And this is how they'll do it. I tried that. God never told you to try anything. He didn't say, why don't you try a cup of this salvation? Try one or two of them tongues. Goo bum. Does that help you in it? No. I, I think Kathy would get very mad at me if I said, Kathy, when, when I married her, I'm going to try to love you. I don't think that'll work. She don't even like, I'm going to try to buy you something. You don't like that neither. We don't try to buy nothing. We want something, we go get it. Now, Kathy, <laughs> she makes me feel so good. She says, Jesse, I don't need that. I said, well, it doesn't have anything to do with need, Kathy. Do you want me to have it? <laughs> See, it has to be my decision. I said, oh, that's what I live for. Amen. I had the Lord ask me one time, he said, why'd you say that to her? I said, marriage. They're not the weaker sex. I don't know where you got that mess from, but that's not true. They, we may be stronger, but they're more powerful. Shout, ladies, I just set you free. I can prove, I've seen it happen so many times. I've been in a car with Jerry Savelle and Carolyn Savelle and, and Kathy. Me and Jerry, we can't, we just follow. Am I correct, Jerry? Jerry can't even drive the car. I mean, he started driving it, and Karen said, you're turning wrong. He just looks at me. I said, hey, I ain't in this. I ain't in this. 
Why'd you go that way? Well, I don't know. Just been doing it for 50 years. <laughs> this word doubt. So write this down and we're going to deal with this part two. Part two. Doubt is a cancer growth in the spirit. Doubt is a cancer growth in the spirit. It must be cut out by the scalpel of faith. What is the scalpel of faith? The sword of the spirit. It's a double-edged sword. One side cut the devil, the other side cuts you. It's been given for spiritual surgery. Let me say it again. Doubt is a cancer growth in the spirit. It must be cut out by the scalpel of faith. If you look at Mark chapter 2, if you can go with me to it, I believe it's verse 8. Well, let me just read verse five. When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, son, thy sins be forgiven thee. But there were certain of the scribes, that's Mark chapter two, verse six now, sitting there reasoning, notice this, in their hearts, not in their heads. You can, doubt is not a problem in the head. It's a problem in the heart Amen. because thoughts kind of come into your mind uninvited. And until you say them, they don't become reality. I like what Brother Hagin said years ago. If you don't speak a thought, it, die, it, 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 it aborts itself. It dies unborn. That's what Brother Hagin said years and years ago. He said, why reason ye in your hearts? Why does this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Don't that sound churchy? <laughs> now that's churchy. And immediately, which is suddenly his twin brother, went... <laughs> Takes a while in Long Beach, but they'll get there. Glory to God. <laughs> and immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, notice he wasn't reasoning in himself. He said unto them, why reason ye these things in your heart? In other words, he said, doubt is now prevalent in your spirit. You have a tumor. You have a cancer. You need spiritual surgery. What is the scapula of faith? The sword of the spirit. One side cut the devil, the other side cuts you. It's a very powerful, I learned that from Billy Rash. I'll never forget that tape. Years, probably about 25 years ago you preached on that. That a double-edged sword. Well, there must be other swords, you know, that are, are, are double-edged. You, it, it, you ought to get Billy's. It's, it's real. I don't know how long ago that was. Billy, what, 25 years? I guess at least. But I never forgot it because I realized it was a revelation. So there must be other double-edged swords that it's sharper than. He said the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. Well, so there must be other swords that it's sharper than if, if the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. I believe I said that correctly. So notice this. Why reason ye in your hearts? See, that's the problem with the church world today. If you go on to God, oh Lord, you're going to get mad when I say this, <laughs> saying, have you seen the price of all today? When I left, it was $143 and something. I, you know, I, I invest in Wall Street and all kind of stuff. And, and I, boy, everybody freaking out. I will not go to God and say, have you seen the price of oil today? You know what he's going to tell me? Why reason ye in your heart? Come on. Are you telling me I can't pay $5 a gallon or $10 a gallon or 50 cents or whatever? That's what you're saying. Yeah, but... Not a, Got to get your butt out the way. <laughs> yeah, but you live up there and I live down here. No, he says, I live inside of you. Amen. I mean, let me ask you this. Have you ever went to the gas station, pull out the pump, and the Holy Ghost came up on you as you was filling up the tank? No. The Holy Ghost ain't worried about how much that gas costs. He's concerned about your seed. Not the price of gas. Why reason ye in your hearts? That's a valid, valid question. Write this down. Doubtfulness. See, there's doubt. Then it goes into doubtfulness. Is a chronic condition of the mind or the soul. It cripples people and makes them hesitant to do nothing. Now, to get rid of doubt and doubtfulness... Remember, it's a chronic condition. It starts in the mind, which, which is not a problem until it seeds itself into the heart, which was these preachers were talking about this. Jesus, why reason you in your hearts? 
whether it's easy to forgive sin or tell us God to walk, but that you may know, not believe, that the Son of Man had authority on the earth. He said, take your bed up and get out of here. Now, most preachers would have said, no, get the cameras. Let's see this miracle. The, most of them would be filming that baby. Come on, Jesus. Hallelujah. Jesus said, get your bed, get up, get out of here. Why? God don't want you around doubt. That's right. He don't want you around doubtfulness. He said, get your bed up, get out of here. Because you see, I don't doubt that that guy, I don't doubt that that guy probably looked at those preachers and said, well, you know, they're the church. So Jesus said, get out of here. What he was doing was, was helping his mind before anything could get in there to, to seed into his heart. Do you see that? Romans chapter 12, verse 2 says, and be not conformed to this world. I'm going to stop there for a minute. You preachers that are messing up with women and stealing money, you have conformed. I couldn't help myself. Lie, you fry. God's granting you mercy because your wife want to kill you while you're sleeping. You don't even know it. I don't understand. I mean, I know it happens, but I don't understand it. Because I'm a spirit man housed in a soul and clothed in a body. Amen. Do you understand? Yeah. Be not conformed to this world. So the world, even though I'm, I'm, in, I'm not of the world, I'm in the world but not of it, does not apply to me. I, 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 I don't deal with that. Why? Because it's Romans 12 too. Be not conformed to this world. God puts, George, God put millions of dollars in my hand every month. Millions. I have never said, I think I'm going to take some. It is not even a temptation. I've seen some beautiful women. I mean, I got eyes. And I see a pretty woman. I said, that's a beautiful woman, but I don't want the woman. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's okay that my beauty, I see a beautiful painting. Wow, that's pretty. Or a house or whatever, you know, whatever you like, you know. A piece of jewelry. I love jewelry, you know, because God loved jewelry. I, I was infected with it. I mean, his, his place has got, he's got jewel stones as foundations and pearly gates and all this. I don't know what y'all going to do when you get to heaven. What are you going to do when you get to heaven? Some of you people don't believe in this stuff. What are you going to do when you get to heaven? There's a gold street. You're going to go, no, Jesus. No, Jesus. <laughs> Put some gravel. Shut up, fool. Just get over into the house. I don't, and I don't covet what someone has, whether it's their jewels or their wife. Now, I've seen some men with some beautiful wives, Boy, but I've seen some with some sweat hogs. And don't shout me, not, don't look around here. I didn't admit you <laughs> because beauty is in the eye of the beholder, but some people look like they're blind. That's all I'm going to say about that. I never forget that not too long ago. Man, this man had an ugly wife. He said, hey, my wife beautiful. I went, what? <laughs> he just kind of snorted out. And I, I said, I tell you what, you got the best. I didn't answer that question. I just said he got the best. <laughs> be not conformed to this world. Now watch this. But be you transformed. Haven't you ever seen the movies Transformers? Be transformed. I'm still thinking about that ugly woman. I'm sorry. Yeah, excuse me. <laughs> but it's some ugly men too. I mean, I'm talking about gag maggot ugly. That's some ugly men. Don't look around here. But be you transformed by the renewing of your mind that you, not God, you may prove. See, you got to prove it in the mind. You don't have to prove it in the heart that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You can't do, you can't understand that until you are transformed. You see, and a lot of people are still in the stage of conform. You see, because doubt is not allowing them to be transformed. And doubtfulness is becoming a very chronic condition 
and it's starting to seed out of the soul, the mind, the will, and the emotion into the heart. And when it gets there, oh, that's when hatred begins to flow. See, that's when, oh man. Because see, Satan does not like to reside in your mind because you can kick him out. Bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. How do I do that? By casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Did you notice that I quoted that backwards? Did you notice I quoted that? If you go read that, I quoted that back. It says, casting down imagination, every high thing exalts itself to the knowledge of God. Bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. But I kind of look at the whole verse and go, you know, I'm going to bring this thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Well, how do you do that? That's the devil talking to that. Well, I cast down this imagination. And this high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. You want to fight with me? I can't fight you. I do not war after the flesh. My weapons are not carnal. But they're mighty through God. You got a problem, devil? Talk to the mighty one. You see my point? Doubtfulness. I don't like doubt around me. I don't like strife around me. That's what I was telling you about Jonah yesterday. See, Jonah caused a lot of people to lose a lot of money on a ship. When he should have come out of that boat. For you that wasn't here yesterday, Jonah was a, just a lazy, no-count prophet at the time. Laying like a lazy, running from God, dis and disobedience, gets in the bottom of a boat and goes to sleep. There's guys trying to pr protect him and save him, and they're throwing their lightning in the ship, throwing all the money away, and he could care less how much money they lost. How many people like that around you Come on now. that are so full of doubt mm. that they're making you lose what you work, and you light, you're lightening the ship, you're doing everything you can. See, I, 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 I take the side of the, the ship owners. What about them guys? They were trying to be nice to this preacher. So you preachers that are messing up with women stuff, man, you know what? Somebody need to throw you overboard. Come on, man. Not, are you going to drown? No, we got a big sloppy fish that's going to swallow you a while. Once you get mixed with a little vomit of the world and get thrown out, maybe you'll get straight. I don't mean that to be rude. That's just simply the truth. I mean, I, I, one thing I know about Jerry Savelle, he's like me. We work like dogs, man. We work hard. He don't need nobody around him. And he's, man, my God, he's trying to get JSMI and he's trying to do this. And he got somebody sleeping in the boat full of doubt, unbelief, bless God. And he's lightening the ship trying to keep this sucker alive. That's why I tell people, you work for me, son. You ain't going to be laying in the bottom of a boat to start with. And number two, I got one of them doubt machines and we'll just x-ray you. <laughs> Get out of here. Do what you got to do. Because I work very hard and I will protect my partner's money. Oh, I'll tell you what, man. My I'll tell you what. I don't waste money. Oh, uh -uh. Uh -uh. You <laughs> but I'll tell you what. I serve a Jewish God. You're going to pay me. Amen. And there ain't no devil in there. He touched my stuff. He's going to return it seven full and I'm going to get his furniture too. Amen. And the subs is his house. I mean, that's mine. You can say what you want. But I don't need somebody laying down in the bottom of my boat. And I'm trying to keep them alive and I'm throwing away everything that I work so hard for. So you need, some of you men need to go home and, and see who's sleeping in your boat. Come on. And how much doubt that's in them. And you can't understand why you're having trouble in your ministry or in, uh, you know, or, or in your church or whatever. Because you got a Jonas there. Now notice once they threw him out, they quit throwing the money away. Everything got come. He was so nasty, he made the dead gum fish sick. That's bad. What was his problem? He, he, he was not transformed. He was in the area of conform. And then even after he obeyed God, he got mad because God wouldn't beat the people up. Isn't that amazing? So doubtfulness is a chronic condition of the mind. It cripples people and makes them hesitant to do nothing. Thanks for listening to this powerful message by Jesse Duplantis. Remember to hit like, subscribe, and the notification bell in order to be up to date with all things Jesse Duplantis Ministries. For more information, visit our website at jdm.org. This media is copyrighted by Jesse Duplantis Ministries for the private use of our audience. Any other use of this media or of any pictures or accounts without Jesse Duplantis Ministries' consent is strictly prohibited.